So <laughs> right now in the background, I think we're going to have the sound of people pinging in and out uh, as they join or leave or as internet drops. Um, if anyone from Informs is able to turn that off while we're going, that'd be great. If not, everyone, please just bear with the doorbell sound. OK, as long as you guys can't hear it, that's perfect. Um, OK, so for tonight, uh, I'm going to try and keep track of the chat and keep track of the reactions window so I can see feedback from you all. But let's keep in mind that I'll have a lot of windows open if I don't respond to your chat or to your reaction um, in a little bit of time. Please feel free to go ahead and unmute and have someone say, hey, Kate, slow down. There's things in chat. Um, it'd be good if you take, took a moment and answered that. So talk about, first of all, who am I? Um, my name is Kate Kreider. My formal title is Research Data Analyst, uh, but what that actually means is I'm the data visualization specialist at the library, so I often give workshops like this um, for topics like Python or using a tool like Tableau, and when I'm not giving workshops, you can come into my office and we can meet about different projects you're working on. So that's who I am. What are we doing today? What is Python? I'm going to go ahead and assume that if you all are here, you're at least already interested in learning Python. You might not know what it is, but you've heard that it's popular. Um, a lot of people are looking for it as a job skill. It can be interesting to work in for personal projects. Um, today, I'll give you the sort of high level overview of what we're doing. And as the workshops go on, um, we'll get more into depth about what actually Python is and what we're doing. But the basic concept is Python is a programming language, the same way you might have heard someone refer to things like JavaScript or R. It's a language that we can use to interact with the computer and do things like process data and create visualizations. Um, so you don't need to have a background in coding in order to do the workshop today or for the other three sessions. Um, all you need to know is that we'll be walking you through all of the steps. So it's okay if you don't have a background. And if all you know is coding is a word and it applies to some of my friends who are CS majors. Okay, so let's talk about what it means to learn coding. Some of you all might have heard the phrase, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. The idea here being, if you can learn a new skill, you can actually feed yourself, um, do things on your own. Whereas if you just get handed something without explanation, it's not that valuable to you. So that's sort of the philosophy we're going to be looking at during the workshop today. Um, a lot of times when you're taught coding or you learn it on your own, uh, someone gives you some code and it means that you can only ever make that one thing. Maybe you can make some modifications to it. Maybe you can copy paste and put in a different data set, but you wouldn't be able to strike out on your own and do a project that you're interested in. So instead, what we're going to be doing throughout the workshop is teaching you how to code so that you can make projects on your own. What that means is a lot of times we'll go over different theories like what happens if you get this error message or how to get yourself out of trouble when you've um, like broken your code so that when you all leave the workshop, you'll be able to do your own projects. Um, the idea here is that we only have four hours over the course of these four workshops, one hour today, and then one hour for each of the other three weeks. But in those four hours, you all will learn enough Python to be able to pursue projects beyond what we do in the workshop. So let's talk about what we're going to be doing in the workshop. Hang on while I move some windows out of the way. So week one, we're gonna be working in the command line. Um, I'm going to explain what that is, but basically we're going to be talking directly to our computer, um, learning how to move around in the command line and get familiar with it. It's a tool that you'll probably have to use for your own Python projects in order to install additional functions you might need or debug if you have an issue. Technically for homework, 
before the next workshop, you would then be installing Python and something called Sublime. We'll cover that, but I wanna be clear, if you are already overloaded and all you can manage to do is attend to the workshop or watch the recording later on, I will provide resources so that you do not have to install Python and Sublime if you want. Um, there will be a way for you to use a temporary instance of Python to follow along with what we've done in the workshop. So if you have trouble installing or you're not sure yet, if you really wanna take that extra time to be able to use Python on your own computer, the homework is truly optional. The second week, we're going to be adding in um, something called an integrated development environment. This is where most people do coding, whether it's Python or JavaScript. Um, they usually use a, something called an IDE, this integrated development environment, to code and debug and save their work. So we're going to move from the command line into an IDE that will serve you for the rest of your coding career should you find you're interested in it and want to pursue more projects. We'll be making a basic network diagram and we'll be using some libraries like Network X and Matplotlib that are very popular. You might have seen them mentioned before. There will be a little homework there. Again, optional if you want to follow along and do your own project. Then the next week, we'll add on a little bit more. You'll be able to customize your network diagram, do something fun that you're interested in. We'll be adding in a CSV, which is like an Excel file with data. That'll make it more applicable to your own projects. If you want to do something cool, like download a bunch of Twitter data, these skills will serve you well. And then on that last week, we're going to be making your network diagram interactive. So at the end of all of these weeks, you should know how to use the development environment, how to connect to a CSV file, and how to make an interactive network diagram with some of the popular libraries that you might use for other projects. So the good news is if you do want to follow along, by the end of the week, you will have access to those libraries that you'll probably use for other projects, and it'll save you a lot of time in the future. So what do you need today? Other than attending or listening to the recording, uh, all you need today is to be able to use Zoom's reactions. This is because I can't see you all. I need to have some sort of feedback to know if uh, things are going well or poorly. So what I want you all to do is find the reactions button in Zoom. Um, for some of you, it may be buried. But if you can find it and give me a green check, if you have found it, that would be excellent. This is what I'm going to use during the workshop to have you all say, oh, you're going too fast, please slow down, or yes, I'm on track, I'm not. I want you to be brutally honest with me. If you are lost and you need me to slow down, we can absolutely do that. But I won't know because I can't see your faces unless I get that green check or red X. So I see in my chat that a bunch of you have gotten green checks. That looks good. I can see that you all have found it. We'll be using that. So let's, without further ado, get started with the actual meat of the workshop. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what is the command line? So this is a diagram that we're going to build on during the workshop today. So there's a lot of empty space here that we're going to fill in. But here's the basic concept. Over on the right, you have your computer. Now, part of the magic of today is that we all have different computers. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of do we have the 12 inch or 13 inch model? Sometimes it's do you have a Mac or do you have a PC? Maybe you've updated your operating system, so you're on Catalina, or you haven't and you're on some old Windows 8. We all have different computers, physical computers, and different operating systems, which is the software on it that helps your computer run. Most of the time when you're dealing with your computer and working with the operating system, you're clicking on buttons. If you're on a Mac, that's when you're clicking at the toolbar on the top. Maybe you're pressing the Apple button. If you're on Windows, you're pressing that Windows bar. You're working with your computer, but everything is about buttons and drop downs and text. 
This is called a UI or user interface, and it makes the experience of working with our computers really pleasant because we don't have to be typing in code all the time to say, I wanna save this file, I wanna delete this, create a new folder. But behind all of those buttons is a language that your computer uses to do all of those tasks. Each time you save a file, there's code running in the background that saves that file. The way that you can access that behind the scenes is through something called the command line. It's a program that runs on your computer. It pulls up in its own window and it allows you to type that background code to talk directly to your operating system. So the diagram that I have here is a representation on the right of your computer in the middle of that command line window and on the left in purple, a single line of CLI or command line interface code. What this is representing is that line by line, you can put a single line of command line code into the command line on your computer and tell your computer to do things. So we're gonna learn a little bit more about that today. The reason why it's applicable for Python is this is the most basic rudimentary way to start using Python but more often it comes up in the course of Python work because you need to install libraries or change where the folder is for something. And you're gonna to wanna to be familiar with the command lines so that if it comes up, it's not something new and intimidating. You're not saying, I don't even know how to find it. You've used it before and feel comfortable at least doing a little bit. But first, a warning, because the command line is talking about the background language with your computer directly to your operating system, it can do anything. That includes deleting everything on your computer. This doesn't mean that you should be afraid to use it. It just means anytime you're going to use the command line and enter a code, know what you're doing first. I'm gonna give you basic commands that should cover 90% of what you want to do. But if you're going to use a new command, something comes up in a tutorial, it's a good idea just to double check and make sure that it's something reasonable, that you know what it's about to do, and that it's not something that someone has posted for a joke to have you copy paste it into your command line and have something strange happen. So the first thing we're all going to do together is I am going to clear all of the reactions and I want everyone to find the command line on your computer. It's going to look different for everyone. And I want you to be active in chat because maybe you have a different version of Windows and it's not quite the same. We're all going to work together to find our command lines. If you are in a Mac, you can find it. It's called Terminal. You can either go to Launchpad if you have a more recent operating system or go to your applications folder and search for terminal. If you're on Windows, it's called command prompt and you can find it by going to start menu and searching for or clicking on command prompt. And if you're on Linux, I have instructions for you here. I'm not as familiar with it personally, but it will either be called console or terminal depending on which version you're on. I am going to step out of the slides for a moment and show you what it looks like on my computer. When you have found it on your computer, if you can give me a green check to say, yes, I have found my command line or a red X if you're lost or put something in chat, that would be great. So again, I'm on a Mac today. I am going to show you what that looks like on my computer. On my computer, I have Launchpad. I have a more recent version of Mac. If I click on that and search for terminal, a program comes up that looks like this. And when I open it, I get a window that looks like this. You may have a different version on your computer. Again, you may have command prompt. If you're on Windows, yours might be black with white text. As long as you've gotten a program that looks like it's either terminal or command prompt, uh, it's a basic window like this, you have probably gotten to it successfully. So let me check to see, I see only a few green checks right now. 
Um, just want to double check, is anyone having issues? Okay, there was a flurry. Thank you. Um, if anyone is lost, now would be a great time to put some questions in chat. Even if I can't help you find your command um, line, it may be possible that one of your peers has gotten the trick to it. So here we are. We have our command line. A reminder, I'm just going to go back to that diagram. We can enter single lines of code here into our command line, which is this window, and we'll be talking directly to our computer and its operating system. Again, warning, we want to be careful what we type in here, but today the things that I'm going to have you use, even if there's a typo or you add some extra characters, there shouldn't be any danger of you doing damage to your computer or removing files. We're just going to be peeking at things today. So don't worry if you mess up or make mistakes. You can always close out of your command line window and get back to it. The bright side of this is it's great practice to find it again. OK, so hopefully you all have found your command line. The next step is we're going to look at some basic commands. Um, the most common thing that you will do in your command line is move between folders. Um, I'm going to pause because I see a question. Do I need to close all open applications before we run any commands? Fantastic question. Um, that's a great idea to be thinking of. No, as long as you aren't putting in any commands that are interacting with those programs, which we won't today, it's a bit like opening a new window in Chrome. Anything we do there shouldn't interfere if you have windows open, you have a YouTube running in the background, should be fine. Excellent question. So the first thing we're going to do is these are some commands I've posted about moving between folders. We'll use those in a minute. But the one tried and true fun thing we can do guaranteed to work for everyone is you can get your computer to talk back to you using command line. And the way that you can do that is you'll see a window like this. You probably have some text in it. It'll be different for everyone. It's information about your operating system and the particular command line interface. But you'll notice for me, it says Kate K at LTS MacBook Pro. This is a line that shows up every time. It's my username. It's my MacBook computer. And then there's a little character here that's a percent sign. This is called a prompt. And it's different for everyone's operating system. Some of you might have a dollar sign. Some of you might have a less than or greater than symbol. Mine's a percent. This is the beginning of where you type your code. So you'll know that you're properly in command line and it's asking you for a new line of code every time you see that prompt symbol. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask my computer to say something back to me. In this case, that command is echo. So you all can type the word echo, press space, and your computer will echo back to you anything you put in quotation marks. So in this case, I'm going to type hello, close that quotation mark. And if I press enter, my computer will say hello back to me in this line. If you all get your computer to say hello, can you please give me a green check? Speak up in chat if something terrible happened. Good, we're getting some thumbs up. Great, great. So you all, I'm going to zoom in so that this is a little bigger, but you all have done your first line of command line code. It doesn't get a lot more complicated than this. Have the same confidence about the additional commands we're going to look at. So this echoes back and forth anything I tell the computer to say. That can be as long as I want. I can say, hello, I am doing command line. And it will put that back. I'm noticing a question in chat. Yours is in quotes. I say it says command not found hellos. OK, so some people might be experiencing some complications if you're using uh, punctuation. For example, if I say echo hello, at least on a Mac, I get this D quote error. That's because some symbols in here 
sort of like the way that the prompt percent sign for me, again, some people might have a dollar sign or greater than equals. Some symbols mean things in command line language. And so your computer might get upset with you and say, I'm not entirely sure what you're trying to do. You can either, in a case like mine, where I'm getting D quote, I can put another quotation mark and it will accept it. But if you get into a situation where there's a weird error and you're not sure what's going on, you can always close out of terminal and start again. It's like getting a blank sheet of paper, pressing undo, starting a new document. There's no downside to doing that. So I'm gonna reopen my terminal. I'm going to zoom back in just so that it's bigger. Please let me know at, at any point during the workshop, I'm using something on my computer that's not big enough to see easily and I will zoom in. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is using the command line to look at the folders in your computer and look at the files that are there. So for just a moment, I'm gonna minimize the slides so that you can see what's on my desktop. My desktop has a folder called clean desktop. It has a Python file, and then it has today's slides in a PDF. There's not that much else on it. So I'm going to pull back up the slides and we're gonna talk about the commands here. So many command line codes are similar for different operating systems, but there will be slight differences. So here I have listed basic commands Mac and Linux should be the same. Windows is a little different, but there are four basic tasks that we might do. The first one is saying, what folder are we in now? What folder is our command line running from? For Mac and Linux, this command is PWD, and that stands for print working directory. Print in computer coding language means the same thing that Echo does. It means say this back to me or print it out in a console, write that text somewhere I can see it. In Windows, the command is CD. So what I want you all to do is in your terminal window, go ahead and write either PWD or CD, depending on which operating system you're in and press enter and it should tell you what folder you're in. I'm gonna clear feedback. How's everybody doing with that? Can I have a green check? Red X, anyone's computer breaking? <laughs> nice, and some thumbs up. Looks like it's going well. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So what this is telling you is the folder that you're currently in. If you haven't pressed a bunch of keys since we started, this is the default folder that your command line will always start in. So it's a great familiar starting place. You'll get used to navigating from here to the folders that you might wanna look at. So let's try the next command. The next command is to list the contents of the directory or folder we're in. For Mac and Linux, that's LS. For Windows, that's DIR for directory. So I want you all to try this next command. For me, I'm typing LS. If you're in Windows, you'll type DIR. If you press enter, you'll see that it gives you, if you have a lot of things, a lot of folders, um, if you only have a few, a few folders, this is at the user's level for my computer. So you'll see that I have important folders like applications, documents, downloads, what I wanna to get to is my desktop. So if you have a similar folder structure, you're going to follow along with what I'm doing. If you're already on your desktop, you can just wait until we get to that step. I'll go back over this uh, time and time again. I see a comment in chat about having a really long list. Yes, uh, there's a reason I clean my desktop before we do these workshops that it looks friendly for you all. So. The next step that I want to do is I'm in this user's Kate K folder. I can see in this folder that there is a desktop folder. That's where I want to get. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the next command, which is change directory, where I have that in the slides, where I have the greater than and less than signs and directory. That's where you put the name of the folder that you'd like to move into. So in this case, I'm going to do CD and then type 
desktop, which I have misspelled. It's okay if you do, it just won't go anywhere. So I've retyped that CD desktop. If I press enter, I will now have moved into that next folder. I can tell because I can see desktop here, but I can also use LS again and see that now I'm in a new position. I'm seeing new folders. I'm seeing what we looked at on my desktop, that folder, the PDF file, and the Python file. So I'm gonna check in with you all once more and clear feedback. You're gonna get sick of me asking for green checks. Is everybody good? Okay, great, that's looking positive. So what we've just done is moved into a new folder. This time, if you repeat your print working directory command, in my case, it's PWD, you'll see that now we are in our users and our desktop folder. Now, what I want you all to practice is not only do we want to be able to go forward in a direction, but sometimes we've gotten into a folder that we don't, we don't want to be in and we need to go one level back out. So in this case, I want you to try the command cd space dot dot. This means change directory, but go backwards. So if you do that, cd dot dot, and then again, ask yourself, where am I print working directory? You'll see you go back to the beginning. So for just a moment, I'm gonna pause. This has the entire steps we did from the beginning of printing our working directory, moving into our desktop folder and back out. I see someone in chat saying they're getting a syntax error. If you'd like to share your error in chat, that might be able to help us uh, figure out what's going on. Um, you might, yeah, someone's getting operation not permitted. What I will say is because we're all on different computers with different operating systems, you might run into some barriers. I would double check first that you're using the right set of commands. Um, if you're on Mac or Windows that you're using that particular set of commands. It's possible that the commands are different. If you're using something more obscure like Linux, I may not have them properly represented here. Uh, if you get a permission error, it could be possible that you'll need to do an additional step to run terminal or your command line as an administrator if you have particular permissions on your computer. What I recommend is after the workshop, copy paste that syntax error into a Google search and it will usually come up with somebody else who's had the same problem and then nice recommendations from people to say, oh, actually, if you're on Windows 8, you need to use CDD. Um, there are some nuances that we might not be able to cover. Um, another thing is we will be setting up a Teams channel for the Python workshop. That might be another great place if you aren't able to resolve the issue on your own to post that question, um, share some information about your operating system and get to the bottom line. If you cannot use your command line, shouldn't be a problem uh, for the rest of today's workshop. We'll still be looking at important things. You'll be watching what I'm doing. Um, you can also email me with your particulars afterward and we can see if we can get it resolved. Okay, so this is the basic concept of moving back and forth between folders. Now I am going to close out of my command line just to start a new fresh session for you all to look at. And we are going to talk about using the command line to use Python. So let me come back into the slides for a moment. And let's talk about using Python. So this is the same diagram that we were looking at before with a single line of command line code going into the command line and talking to your computer. One of the most basic ways to use Python is that we take single lines of Python code and we run them in something called the Python shell. What happens is you pull up the command line and you run a program involved in Python inside the command line. This is called the Python shell, and it interprets Python code for you. So it's a bit like a translator. It takes in Python code, translates it um, into a format 
using the Python interpreter that then your computer can read the same way that it might read command line code. What this means is when you install Python, you're actually installing this Python shell and Python interpreter. And right away, without doing anything else, after you've installed it, you can start interacting with Python using the command line and single lines of code. This is going to become a little bit clearer as I work through it. But what I'm going to do now is show you an example of how this works. Hang on. That skipped ahead a slide. I'm going to go back. All right, so what we're doing right now is I have the command line open. I have not asked you all to go ahead and install Python. You may or may not have it on your computer. Um, it's not a problem for today. That's homework for the end of the workshop. You don't need it in order to follow along. Just watch um, the command line window and we'll discuss what's happening and how it will relate to what you'll be doing um, for next week. Okay, I'm just gonna zoom in so that this is extra nice and big. So I am in a new command line window. I haven't done anything. If I were to say print working directory, I'd show up in that same directory that we were in last time. In this case, what I'm going to do is call Python 3. I have version 3 of Python on my computer. So when I do this and press Enter, Python 3 or this Python shell pictured in the diagram comes up and now I'm interacting with that Python shell within the command line. The reason that I know that is not only did I run Python 3 and my computer didn't cry out and give me a bunch of error messages, but it printed out a bunch of information implying here I am, I'm starting to use Python 3. But the biggest cue is that when I was just using the command line interface, my prompt was that percent sign. Now it's changed to three greater than signs. So I can tell that I'm using something different within command line because now I have this prompt symbol, which is implying anything I type now is going to be used and interpreted by Python. So when we first pulled up the command line interface, I had you all type echo. Now I'm going to do the equivalent in Python just to show you how it works. In this case, it's called print. And it's this function format where I say the word, the name of the function print. I do a parenthesis, same as last time. I put something in quotation marks, in this case, hello and I do a close parenthesis. So again, this is mimicking when we were talking to the computer and we said echo, hello, Python syntax. This is print, hello in parentheses. If I press enter, Python will now have my computer say something back to me. I see in chat someone saying Python 3 is not recognized. A lot of you will probably get it if you were trying to do this. Um, as I was, Python 3 is probably not installed on your computer. Um, if you're using a Mac, there might be a Python 2 by default. That's something quirky that Macs do. If you're on a Windows computer, you probably don't have it at all. Um, at the end of the workshop today, we're going to describe how to download and install Python if you want. For right now, we're just following along. So I would expect you get a Python 3 is not recognized message. Your computer doesn't know how to recognize it because it searches for Python 3 on your computer and doesn't find anything it can use. Okay, so coming back to the command line, again, what I've done is print hello. Now this right now doesn't really show off the power of Python. Why would I bother to use print hello and load Python shell when I could just have my computer use echo hello all day long? The reason is that Python over time is going to allow us to chain certain commands together. So in this case, the next line I'm going to do is I'm gonna create and save something as a variable. There's a lot of different uh, syntax requirements for naming variables, but for right now, I'll say to you, if I use my name, uh, this is just a word. I'm not using any creative characters or numbers. It's just text. It could be anything. 
It could be your name. I could add a bunch of gibberish. It doesn't matter. In this case, though, I'm using the sensible variable name, my name. I'm setting it equal to Kate, which is my name, and I'm pressing enter. This now is saved in this Python instance. So if I ask the computer, my name, what is that value, and press enter, it will return Kate back to me. The advantage of this is I can start to build on things I've done previously. Now I can say print hello. I'm going to add an extra space here. I can add on my name and press enter, and it will say hello with my name. So again, what this is doing is showing the advantage of Python is that over time, I can sort of save information built on what I've done before. Um, and we're going we're gonna to build on that in just a minute, but I see some questions coming up in chat. Someone is asking, can I use Anaconda prompt instead? Um, for people not familiar, Anaconda is a common sort of add-on that people use to manage, um, to manage various data science tools on their computer. So you might use it to get R, but also Python. I believe you can use Anaconda prompt, but I'll be honest that I don't use Anaconda, so you might need to double check it. Um, for people who have Anaconda installed on their computer and are interested in using it, you may be able to follow along during the workshop with some slight differences. You can download Python through Anaconda. I welcome you all to do that, but if you run into errors, you may need to share it with other Anaconda users within this group so that we can all figure out the little nuances together. Uh, someone is saying when they try and enter Python 3, it's taking them to the Microsoft Store to download Python. Again, it might have been a little misleading that you all were following along up until this point where I started to type Python into the command line. Um, I don't expect anything to happen on your computers when you're typing in Python 3. If you're on a Windows computer and you start to type Python, when it recognizes you don't have the program, it tries to helpfully take you to the App Store to get it. So that's why you're seeing that message. Um, someone is asking, um, why I write with double quotations and it appears with single quotations. What they're talking about there is, for example, I'm going to highlight when I saved my name with double quotations, when I asked for it back, it gave it to me with single quotations. That's a slight syntax difference um, in a lot of coding languages. It doesn't matter if you use a single quote or double quote. Um, sometimes the computer has a preference for one versus the other. Um, I welcome you to experiment with them back and forth. Oftentimes it's equivalent. It's just a question of how you entered it and what the default for the language is. Someone else is asking, are these commands case sensitive? Um, for command line, I think it depends on, uh, on which command line interface you're using. Um, I could be wrong here, but I think Linux might be kind of picky about case, whereas Windows is a little bit more liberal. Um, you are welcome to experiment with it. Uh, you're not going to do damage to your computer by trying to capitalize certain letters or not. Um, and it's a great way to get to know your command line interface and to feel confident um, giving it commands and having it give you back errors or not knowing what you're talking about, you'll start to learn the nuance. Um, someone says, so my name doesn't need to be defined as a string or some data type else in Python. Ah, what people are talking about here is in some coding languages, I would need to say something instead of just my name equals Kate. I would need to define the type of variable and say something like string my name equals Kate. Um, no, in Python, you don't need to tell it if it's a number or if it's a string. We'll go over that a bit more in the later days, but Python tries to do as much as possible to make writing code casual language. So if I have quotation marks around something, it will recognize that as it is. <laughs> I cannot type today, guys. If I have quotation marks around something, we'll recognize it as a string. If I start to put 
math symbols next to something, it will recognize it as a number. Um, okay, and again, someone is saying in chat that they have Python 1 already. Um, yes, Python 1 will probably do some of what I'm doing today, but I'm going to have everyone install Python 3 for homework so that we're all using the same system and so that you're learning on the most recent version. Uh, again, in chat, someone has put something in for Anaconda. Um, Windows 10 user has a message. If someone else is seeing that, maybe you can help out. I'm going to go ahead and move forward at the moment um, so that uh, we can get some more of the content done and I will make sure I come back to chat. But just to recap again, what I was doing here is I pulled up the command line. I ran Python 3, which I do have installed. You all will have installed it for the next workshop instance. That brought up this Python shell that then interpreted Python into a language my computer could understand. I'm going to close out of this terminal once more. It's going to ask me if I want to terminate it. This message didn't appear last time. That's because it's taking an extra step to say, hey, you started running Python shell. Do you want to close out of it? I do. Feel confident at any point pressing terminate if that prompt comes up and starting over. You really have almost nothing to lose by starting over. So again, I have a new command line session. I'm zooming in so that it's a little bit easier to see. And this time we're gonna go up a level. So I'm adding to the diagram. I'll zoom in a moment here. The other way that you can work with Python is rather than laboriously entering each line and not really being able to save it in command line, is you can take multiple lines of Python code and put them into a text editor as long as you save the file properly with a .py, py for Python extension, uh, it will be a piece of Python code we can then feed this into the same shell program and it can be interpreted and come out the other side. So I'm gonna show you all what this looks like. Hang on, it likes to jump forward a slide. So I have a file here on my desktop called test.py. I am going to open it in a text editor for me. Um, we'll talk about this software, this program a little bit later, but you'll notice it has the same type of code that I was typing in earlier line by line. So this is test.py. It is on my desktop. So what I'm going to do is that same sort of folder traversing we did last time. I'm going to say, where am I? I'm in users slash Kate. I want to get to where that test.py folder is. So I say list the folders, where do I want to get? I want that desktop folder. So I CD or change directory into desktop. I check the contents again using LS. And now I can see that test.py file. So now I'm in the folder that contains that file. This time I can run Python 3 test.py. And this will run that script and I will get hello Kate without running all of those lines line by line. So again, the difference here is rather than running Python 3 and then entering each line individually, I have them in this text file and I can run the whole file. So you can begin to imagine, I could have hundreds and hundreds of lines of code and rather than entering them manually, I can have the Python shell connect to this file and run everything in it. So we're gonna go back to that diagram for a moment and talk about it some more. So again, what I was doing was multiple lines of code in that .py file were being run the same way that I was entering single lines of code, but now more efficiently. The next level up from this and where we're gonna sort of wrap up today is there something called an integrated development environment or IDE? This includes the text editor where I edit multiple lines of code, the Python shell where that code is processed, and the interpreter 
which translates the code into the language that the computer understands. What this means is you can work happily all day in an IDE without having to go back and forth in terminal. You don't have to open and close it. You don't have a text editor and terminal open. You have one window that runs and translates everything. Now, when you install Python, it comes with a Python only development environment. It's called idle. Many people use it, but for the purpose of the workshop, I'm going to have you all download something called Sublime Text. Sublime Text is also a development environment, but it can handle multiple languages. So the advantage of learning to use Sublime is if later on you want to learn JavaScript, you don't have to learn a new development environment. You'll already have it. So again, when you install Python, it comes with an IDE called idle. If for some reason you really want to use it, I don't have objections, but for the purpose of the workshop, we're going to try and learn sublime text because it is an IDE that can interpret multiple languages, allowing you all to use it for years to come with whatever language you might end up learning. That includes if you get interested in developing web pages, um, it'll allow you to edit HTML and CSS and JavaScript. So it's really versatile and it's the kind of thing that you might run across um, in say a co-op, uh, your uh, professional coding environment or project team probably has an IDE very similar to Sublime. And at least now you'll understand the context. Here's command line, which is like the rawest form of talking to your computer. Here's Python shell, which is the next step up from that, where we can enter line by line. There's text documents where we can have multiple lines. And now you'll get a sense for there's an IDE that contains it all. So let me show you all just for a moment what that looks like. When I originally opened that text file, I opened it in Sublime. This is the IDE that we'll be using. You'll notice right now, it doesn't seem very remarkable. It sort of has the text in there with some line numbers, but there are some different colors here than if you were just typing it into the command line interface. This is syntax highlighting, and it helps you keep track of what's going on here. Things that are white are variables in this case, yellow are strings, and blue is print, that's a function. This helps you read your code more quickly and is advantageous when you're trying to figure out, oh, did I leave something out? Maybe a quotation mark. Um, the next step from here is this is the text file. When I wanna get the equivalent to what I was seeing here in the command line interface, I build it. Uh, that is a shortcut key that we will learn, but I'm going to press on my computer command B and you'll see here at the bottom, a new window appears that says, hello, Kate. This is the same output that was in our command line, but now I can close out of this and all day long, I can type and program here. I can make my name Kate the Great if I want, if I'm feeling grand, I can run it again and you'll notice that it updates down here. So now there's a smoother process. There's no terminal involved. I can get hundreds of lines of code in here. I can get multiple codes going. Um, and this way I can keep track of my files. I'm gonna take a moment now to check chat. Uh, can I zoom in? Thank you. Yes, I can. Thank you all. I rely on you telling me to speak up when something's too small. I really appreciate it. So again, um, at the top here is my text editor. And at the bottom here is my console window, which is basically showing me the same output that would have happened if I had typed this into the command line. So I know this is a lot to process for today. So I'm gonna come back around to the slides to finish. And did I press enter for running the code again? No, not this time. This time I pressed build. Um, we'll go over it, uh, to, not tomorrow, <laughs> next week when we have the next workshop, um, but build does something very similar. 
Uh, it just includes that Python shell and interpreter phase in addition to just pressing enter and running the command. So we'll get into it. Um, but again, what we learned today is you all used your command line for the first time. That's what's in purple in this diagram. We took a look at using Python in the shell. That's when I ran Python 3 and did things. We looked at using it in a text editor. That's when I just had the PY file and I loaded it. Um, and we looked at the integrated development environment. So for the rest of the workshop, we're going to be hoping to use Sublime Text, which is that development environment that has all of the pieces that could know multiple languages if you get interested in that. And I'm going to wrap up here with the homework. Again, let me reiterate, if you're tired and all you can do is watch the recording or show up every day to the workshop, that's fine. But if you would like to have uh, this on your own computer and be able to follow along with the workshop as we go, there are two things I'll hope you'll do for homework. The first is to install Python 3. Um, you will need to check first if you already have Python 3 installed. I've included the command line code that you'll need to run on different operating systems. If you get an error, you probably don't have Python 3. Um, if you get a version number back, you probably do. Um, you can also try running Python 3 on your computer. Um, if you do not have it, which is likely, you'll need to install it. I've included the site to uh, download it. And also over on the right-hand side, I have included a guide for each operating system. I highly recommend you follow one of the guides. Um, and you take your time. Don't do this when you're tired. You want to make sure you do it right the first time. Again, if you're using something like Anaconda to manage software on your computer, you can use that. Um, and the second thing would be to download and install Sublime. That should be fairly straightforward. Um, I want to reiterate because I see a question in chat and also I've been going pretty fast today. I will be sending the slides out afterwards. So any of these links, you don't need to hurry and write them down. I'll be sure you have a copy of them as well as a copy of the recording if you want to go back and reference things. Um, the next piece that I'll just cover quickly is how can you get help? So I have a few links here for the topics we've covered today. If you're still feeling confused about command line, um, this is a great introductory tutorial. If you get stuck on installing Python, there were guides on the other page, but um, you can see additional guides here. And then for general help, if you're interested, I've included um, some websites that I recommend for specific or general tutorials, places to look for questions, or most importantly, bottom right is my information, including a link to schedule virtual consult appointments with me. Now, I may not be able to answer everyone's questions during the workshop if there are a lot of them, so I highly recommend you join that Teams channel that Alex put the code into chat for. That'll help us work as a community and cover everyone's different operating systems and different errors you might creatively run into. I want to address, I also see a comment in chat about if you are a beginner, should you attend the 7 p.m. workshop or should you practice this? Um, entirely up to you. So for those who don't know, the beginner workshop goes from six to seven for these four weeks. Uh, there will be an intermediate workshop after that from seven to eight. It won't be happening tonight. Unfortunately, uh, the instructor is going to be unavailable. So we're just going to push the intermediate workshop uh, by a week. You are welcome to attend both if you're interested, um, if you're feeling ready for that, or you just wanna take a sneak peek. Um, there's no reason why you can't peek into the intermediate workshop, even if you're not ready to work on uh, that material yet. Uh, I'm sure you're welcome to view it. So we are coming up on the hour. I wanna be mindful of everyone's time and just say, I've included two more slides here about um, different projects that you might be interested in looking at, examples of how Python's used. You're welcome to look at that later on. But the most important thing is just show up for next week's workshop and we'll cover a little bit more then. I will stay on for questions 
but please feel free to go about your evenings. And thanks everybody for coming and taking an hour out of your valuable time to learn Python and command line. Yeah. Please don't hesitate to reach out with errors. I will do my best to help you all. Um, also don't hesitate to reach out to your colleagues on Teams. This is a team effort. It takes a village. Thank you all. Um, I also put in the chat um, the Teams code Thank if you, you all want to join. And also our um, YouTube channel link is there. So the recording will be on the YouTube channel as well. Great. I will stop recording.